Peckinpah came up to me completely drunk and uh, f***ed up on God knows what and said, are you Italian? <laughs> yes. Then I want you to give me $10,000. <laughs> Hello there, and welcome back to the Disconnected. I am here with Eugenio Ercolani, and I'm so excited to do this because last time you were here, it's been, I think we're almost at nine months, some something like that. But last time we were cut very short. Yes. I, uh, I, I think last time I had basketball practice, I had to run to, and I had to cut like immediately as soon as our hour was up. <laughs> now, I'm super psyched to be here and glad we could... Uh... You know, continue continue our uh, our conversation. Um, so, how are, how are things been? How uh, well, have you it's, been? it's been busy for both of us. Uh, I've had just some crazy stuff going on behind the scenes for the channel and with uh, some of these labels. But I mean, last time we were talking, you were about to do a documentary. You just released a book. You've got all kinds of films that have been released in the last year. How, how's your year been overall? Ah, oh, damn. Uh, it's been uh, it's been good. Um, it's definitely been dense. Uh, it's been packed with uh, with events and work. Um, at times, a little overwhelming. Um, I have to admit, um, slightly frustrating uh, because you know you get to work on a lot of stuff, which is great. But sometimes, you know, you especially in periods where you're working so much, you want to do things a little better and go deeper. And, uh, you know, you look back at some projects and kind of go, Oh, you know, I could have, I could have done that thing better. And, right. you know, so it's, it's, uh, where there's, where there's quantity, there are always kind of shifts in quality. Uh, so the trick is to try to, you know, create the highest standard possible. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of, you know, trying, keeping everything in check and, you know, maintaining that standard as high as possible, which I hope I do. I try to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been good though. I can't complain. I mean, um, as you said, a lot of things happening, a lot of projects. Um, so yeah, life, um, and it's been even packed on a personal level. I've, uh, had a big move. Um, it's definitely one of those, uh, before and after years, you know? Yeah, and last time, I think it was like two or three days later, you were about to embark on that documentary. How'd, how'd that whole process go? Oh, uh, yes. Well, that went well. Um, we are, uh, at the moment, we are deep into mix and color, uh, which is obviously the last stage of any kind of filmmaking, filmmaking process. It's kind of stitching up the wound. You know, there's no going back, or there shouldn't. You know, one would hope, um, but uh, but no, it's it's been uh, it's been good. It went. It was a pleasurable experience. Uh, it's definitely um, it's a kind of a weird documentary because um, there are basically it, its grammar is slightly strange. There are three different approaches. The linguistically speaking, so you've got kind of a more filmic approach um by filmic i mean you know proper film it has a very in the cinematography and the editing is uh very film-like and then you've got more traditional documentary within it but even there it mixes up with a kind of breaking the fourth wall if you will or kind of a more reportage kind of approach so uh, it's it's uh, definitely a, a strange little project which hopefully will be seen uh, relatively soon, I'd say within the year, it should start circulating. Nice. Uh, and circulating stuff. We've got a whole bunch of stuff in the last year that have been amazing. Let me uh, strategically place a finger. Uh, Frankenstein 80. Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, that came out. We got City of the Living Dead. You had some hands on this. Uh, we talked about this last time. We finally got Tentacles. We do. And then uh, I think this was in the last year. Whipping the Body just came out. Yeah, should be, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, it's, isn't it like January? Something like that. Something like that. And then, uh, let's and then see. the most recent release, I think, is this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That bad boy came out. Uh, well, within this, within the last year, then also Cold Eyes of Fear. Yeah. 
quite a few from Indicator, right? Uh, well, uh, two have been announced uh, and one has been released. Uh, but I can definitely say there's a lot more where those came from. Uh, nice. So I'm, I'm going to be working for, I think, at least uh, the next year on six, seven Indicator releases. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, Indicator... Uh, is definitely going to be in my life for some time. What else? The Last Hunter also came out. Ah, uh, did yeah. So yeah, yeah, quite a quite a f- Cannibal Holocaust. Was that the last in the, within the last year? Oh, absolutely, that one was yeah. Um, Burial Ground, The Ark of the Sun God, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure a couple of uh, Anolis Entertainment releases as well. Definitely. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not staring into nothingness. I'm. I'm actually looking at a wall full of uh, of Blu-rays here, uh, <laughs> trying to. Oh yes, well, um, um, I'm pretty sure Blood Delirium was within the last year. Yes, I think so. Just it's probably on the cusp. Yeah. It's just, yeah. just yeah. But uh, yeah, don't open till Christmas. But, yeah. Uh, all, all those dates start to blend for me. I mean, there, there's so many releases coming out. It's it's hard to keep a grasp on when everything comes out. Well, to me, it, it, stuff comes out when I receive it. So <laughs> that uh, and that might take some time. Uh, you know, not all labels are uh, quick on their feet to send me right. contributor right. copies. But um, but yeah, no, it's. Um, oh, of course. Uh, well, I mean, I know this was a big disappointment for English speaking markets but uh, the last shark or also oh. the last jaws uh that was from anolis entertainment um yeah. Yeah. that was released as well um so yeah yeah busy i've been a busy boy <laughs> very busy boy and uh i mean i gotta say after we last talked for the year prior i'd been seeing a lot of your work but man this last year noticing your interviews the the questions you ask how you shoot them I appreciate them so much more. They, they are a sure. gift on some of these discs. So I just, can you go into your process? Like how you try to think through what you want to accomplish when you're interviewing some of these people from, you know, 45 years ago, they, they made this, this piece that maybe was just a small part of their life, but a lot of people love some, 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 some old obscure film that was maybe, you know, sleazy that they think is a master. Well, uh, Okay, so there's 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 a lot to unpack. Um, let's start by saying that uh, well, we were we were talking about this just before uh, recording. Yeah. Um, yep. I um, you know, I don't um, see my work as um, kind of celebrating the film I'm working on. Uh, I'm the guy who hopefully tries to tell the story behind the film and kind of give context, both social, political, uh, and of course, you know, relating to the industry itself, um, and tell the stories of the people who worked on the film, uh, and hopefully in the process also entertain. Um, so I'm, I like to think of myself more as a film historian, um, that kind of uses different, uh, elements and different languages to be able to tell the story of that film. Uh, so audio commentaries and booklets and video essays and, of course, featurettes and mini docs or whatever it is. Um, and I, yeah, I don't... Um, uh, I'm interested more in what's around the film. Um, it's great to work on a, on a good film and a film I appreciate on an artistic level and creative, but... Um, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee, uh, for me personally, entertainment or right, right. Uh, necessarily um, anything particularly interesting to say. Um, so, um, you know, you w- I've worked on some films that are terrible, are absolutely fucking terrible. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, uh, but, the, you know, it's amazing that they were made. It's interesting to know how they were made what kind of market there was. And I think, you know, this relates also to the big fascination people have for some films is because it's not just nostalgia. It's because 
you know, you know, watching that, that that could never be made now. It's right. really, and even if it was a, a film that's only, let's say, uh, uh, 20 years old, 25 years old, 30 years old, it's a completely different world culturally. The, 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 the social and political tone is completely different. Um, the market has changed radically. And so there is an element also of transgression, you know, to be able oh, yeah. to watch oh, yeah. these films uh, and kind of, rem you know, remain in awe that, they could be made in the first place and they actually had a market and were released in, in cinemas and they were part of the mainstream flocks of production. Yeah. So um, there's that element as well. So to me, I approach every film with, um, well, first of all, try balancing out uh, what I'd like to do uh, with what, you know, budget um, and turnaround and, you know, and deadlines yeah. actually, you know, put me in the position to do. And unfortunately, those two things can be extremely different. Um, you know, uh, sometimes you're given two weeks uh, and very, very small budget to be able to put together extras. So, um, and, you know, this is this is my full-time job. So, you know, I have to try to, you know, uh, get everybody who's worked on it uh, on, the, on the extras paid, uh, you know, cut out uh, something for myself, but also uh, do something which will make, you know, the consumer will make uh, who buys the uh, release happy. So I have to combine that. Um, but relating more to what, you know, how I uh, approach the content, um, I like to think, and this is, you know, very much not up to me to, uh, to the, you know, uh, to say, but I like to think that, I think a little bit out of the box, you know, yeah. that I try yeah. to deliver something that is slightly different. Uh, so I try to interview, uh, you know, trying to deliver the name, the cult name, you know, that you want to see in that release. But then I try to put somebody who's never been interviewed or never been interviewed on that film. Um, you know, and in that sense, um, I'm happy to say that I gave a voice to people that literally, you know, have never appeared on video on camera, like uh, recently Alberto Moriani, the editor, a uh, very prolific editor from the uh, early 70s onwards. He's worked mainly for Dania Productions and he's worked with pretty much every everybody that went through Dania, from Tarantini, uh, Lenzi, Fulci, Margheriti, uh, Girolami, uh, and he'd never been interviewed. Um, nobody had tracked him down. Uh, you know, so I'd like to go and look for people that, you know, um, are, a bit, uh, are a bit different from what you'd expect. Um, and um, as far as the interviews go, uh, it really comes down to three main rules I give myself, which is uh, no director, no, you know, uh, personality, talent, whatever you want to call it, actually likes within the context of an interview a fanboy. Nobody likes a fanboy. Right. Um, right. Fanboys are great. You know, fans in general, they're great, but that's not the context they want uh, somebody like that. Uh, they want don't want to be inter interviewed by a fanboy. You, they want somebody who definitely uh, appreciates their work, um, but. Uh, it can get awkward, I think, for them uh, to have someone who's there kind of uh, um, telling them how great they are all the time. Right. Uh, so my my approach is uh, I try to be as, you know, uh, detached, um, kind, uh, and try to kind of put myself on their the same wavelength, try to figure out what their wavelength is and, and adapt so, you know, if I feel there's somebody who needs a little, you know, a bit of ego patting, then, you know, I'll, I'll throw out the, the compliment to try to make them relax. If they're very detached and, you know, they're very formal, then, you know, I'll behave consequentially. Um, so I'll, I'll try to adapt. But fundamentally, um, I don't want them, I want them to feel comfortable enough so they can talk. Um, 
but I want them to be a little bit on their feet. Um, I'll always leave the, you know, I'm not interviewing, obviously, Saddam Hussein, so, you know, they're not going to be, you know, <laughs> dramatic questions, uh, you know, uh, but I, there are always a couple of questions that I know might piss them off, uh, and, you know, sometimes I deal with very prickly personalities, and so I leave those questions right till the end. Right. Because I don't want to fuck up the interview, so <laughs> you know I'll I'll leave it right till the very last moment. Any question that might piss them off, um, and I don't prepare questions. I don't go there with sheets of paper. I don't, uh, you know. Um, I usually, you know, I I know what they what they've done, and I'm I'm I think prepared enough to interview them. If I'm not, or if I feel that I need some. You know, prepping, uh, I will do that, but, you know, I want to be looking at in their eyes the whole time. Uh, I don't bring notes uh, and I don't bring questions. And also, I never write them down for one reason that once I've written down a question and I've written a list, um, my mind will go back to it, even if I'm not in front of it. And actually, I'll lose opportunities rather than actually gaining something. Yeah. Uh, if I'm there, kind of think, oh, but I had to ask that question, but I'm not actually listening to what they're saying. Um, and also, very last, I, I said three rules. I probably said ten by now. But anyway, <laughs> the the let's say the third is not to have an ego. Um, this is not about you. This is about them. Right. Um, and I I kind of smile a little bit when I I especially when you read them in magazines. Um, interviewers uh, really trying to show the person they're interviewing how intelligent they are, you know, giving elaborate, you know, why did you do this? Because you connected it with that. And, you know, did you take inspiration there? And it feels very ego referential. It feels very self-referential. Um, you know what? Best questions are the simplest. Uh, it puts the person, the the the, the person, the interviewee, uh, in the position of actually expanding on their thoughts. If your question is way too restrictive and you're asking something super specific, you they can answer yes, no, uh, or if they're, if they're a person pleaser, they will just say yes to whatever theory you are giving them because they want to make you happy. Uh, so easy, simple questions, and then it's like an onion. You you know you go tighter and tighter, but start. You know how was it working on that film? You know how was it? How did you find yourself with this actor? Uh, why did you choose that actor? Uh, and then you kind of go deeper, 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 and then you start asking the specific questions. But always, uh, you know, leaving them, they have to feel they're at the center of things. Um, they're. Um, yeah, it's not it's not about the person interviewing. Um, I think a lot of people forget that. Right, um, right. So yeah, those those are my those are my rules. Don't know if any of that actually answered your question. <laughs> well, uh, on on that note, I've noticed in about five or eight of your uh, interviews, you have this one brown book in the background. Is that to symbolize the? I'm just kidding. Just to go off. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's um, that's that's pretty much that that is in a, in a very big nutshell um, my uh, my approach. But but at the end of the day, there you know it's um, it comes down to um, who you're interviewing, why you're interviewing them, um, and you know it's uh, it's always a bit tricky because you know you you deal with a lot of really unpleasant people as well. I mean, you, you know, um, and I don't censor, right, um, right. you know, I, whatever they say goes, you know, unless they specifically tell me and I'm, you know, obviously I, you know, they sign a disclaimer at the end. So if they tell me, you know, could you cut that out? Of course I will, you know, whatever they ask, I will do. But if they don't specify, it all goes in, you know, they're big boys. They take responsibility for what they say. Uh, so unless there is actually an exception, unless I have a feeling, because I interview obviously a lot of very old people, right. um, that they're not completely with it. 
you know what I mean. You know, they're they're losing a bit touch with reality. There's, it's, there's a senile spot there. Then I will, then I will be careful uh, about what I keep in. Um, that, and I give you an example. Ruggero Deodato, his last interviews were very unhinged, very problematic. Um, and I, you know, I cut I cut stuff out. Uh, you know, when I, me and Jay Cheel, uh, when. When we worked together, he was a director. When we worked together on uh, Cursed Films, uh, the episode dedicated to Cannibal Holocaust, I was an associate producer on that. Um, and I, I uh, followed the whole production, all the interviews. And uh, and also Joe uh, is there. Joe Rubin from Vinegar Syndrome is in that, yeah. uh, in that uh, episode. Uh, we, Me and Jay had long conversations about what we should keep in um, uh, regarding uh, Ruggero, because, you know, he, he said some pretty, um, you know, kind of like, yeah, problematic, problematic shit. And, uh, and we, we, we chose to cut some of it. We, some of it is there. Some of it we cut, uh, mainly because we were not 100% sure if he fully realized what he was saying. Right. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to take advantage of somebody's age or mental health, so I'd never do that. Uh, but that aside, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever they say goes in. Well, and you you called them prickly for a moment, but uh, for a lot of people that haven't seen these, and I guess you did kind of allude to this other aspect. But not only are they very old, a lot of the people that you get, this is their first time on camera. So not only, uh, not only are they sort of you know, remembering something from decades prior, they're, they're probably nervous. And a lot of people don't understand that aspect. They, they're a director, but they're, they're nervous to go into this process for maybe the first time. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some are, um, uh, you, you get two kind of problems because people who, uh, I prefer actually talent who has never been in front of the camera. Uh, number one, it makes my life a lot easier because whatever they say, you know, literally whatever they say, even if they start, you know, giving you a recipe for, um, you know, carbonara, <laughs> it's the first time they've said it on camera. So it's all good. You know, just keep on talking. That's fine. Uh, the problem is with people who are, have become kind of professional interviewees. Uh, so people like Ruggero, for example, uh, Sergio Martino, Castellari, the good thing is, you know, they're perfectly comfortable. You know, they get all the beats. They just start talking. You know, they start uh, their whatever their reasoning, their answer. They go full circle, close it with a bow. Amazing. The problem is they have their go-to stories. Yeah. Yep. Uh, they will, which will spout out every fucking time you interview them. Uh, so you have to circumnavigate all that. And the only way to do that is actually to let them vomit it all out. You know, they have to say it, done, you've got it, and then you start asking more questions. They have to get it out of their system. Um, and then you can start talking about whatever interests you. Uh, but yeah, you get a lot of people that have never been, as you said, never been interviewed, never been on camera, and uh, they're very nervous. It's always fun to watch how some people change. Um, so, uh, you know, I, w I remember uh, at least, uh, I'd say a handful, three, four, five people I've interviewed that are really kind of quite coarse uh, and, uh, you know, very over the top. And, um, and then they, you know, you... You place them in front of the camera and they become, you know, lords. You know, they become, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, British royalty. And, um, but yeah, but, uh, but then and you kind of, you look at them, you know, when the first time when you don't know they're going to do that, you kind of look at them and they say, okay, five minutes ago you were telling me, you know, about all the actresses you managed to get, you know, in bed with. Uh, giving me every possible detail about the experience, and now you're talking like um, you're meeting the Queen. So, um, 
So I'm very curious to see how that changes, you know. Yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting change, and people that mask literally when they go on camera, they're a completely different person. Love that. <laughs> uh, other than the interviews, I mean, one of the big things from this year, we got to dive into the book. You've got a book in the U.S. It, I technically I don't think it's even available on Amazon yet, but it's available from the publisher, right? It's available from uh, McFarlane Press. Yes. Uh, now let me, let me do, wait a second. I'll do a little bit of product placement. There it is. There it Darkening is. the Sorry. Italian screen. T- exactly. Um, this is quite big. Like, I don't know if you can tell, but this is quite a big, you know, <laughs> it's quite a big one. Um, just as well, it's the same format, uh, of darkening the Italian screen one. Um, the less pages, um, it's not as chubby as the first one, uh, but it's still packed. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I, okay. So as far as content is concerned, um, um, well, I won't say. I mean, you know, it's up to the readers to decide which book is better. But I can tell you this: I think this is structurally, and let's say formally, I think it's uh, a better book than the first one. Um, I think, um, you know, some minor issues, structural, uh, have been, uh, I think, uh, dealt with within this, within this book, which were present in the first one. Um, each uh, chapter, just, just like in Darkening the Talent Screen 1, is dedicated to um, a different director. There's a, a relatively long essay, uh, which is about the context of the period, uh, there's a lot of gossip because, you know, uh, if enough time passes, gossip becomes history, as we well know. Oh, yeah. So, um, and we've got, uh, the essay and then we've got the very long interview with the, uh, uh, director in question. And we've got Luigi Gozzi. We've got, um, actually, which directors do you know? Tell me, Ryan. Let's see. <laughs> which, which directors do I know? Yes. So, uh, well, are you kind of aware of their work and, you know, of you're course, kind of a, of a fan of Luigi Cozzi? Uh, let, let's go through a big one. Uh, Lamberto Bava. Lamberto Bava. Okay. So, Lamberto Bava, he's one of the biggest chapters, obviously, of the book. The two biggest chapters are uh, Assonitis. Assonitis is... Uh, is uh, uh, an incredible character. Actually, you know what? Uh, re- regarding that, I will read just one little paragraph. Perfect. From the Asunitis chapter. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where is it? No, this is Bava, Antonio Bido. For all the Giallo fans. Here we go. Uh, bu- 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 Ah, brilliant. So, um, you are, I imagine, um, I imagine you are aware that um, Asonitis uh, kind of produced, um, well, in that case, he didn't actually direct anything. Uh, He didn't, I think, do one scene. But anyway, he's the producer of um, this film called... um, uh, the Visitor. Of course, The Visitor, yeah. Which was released, I believe, uh, from Arrow. Arrow video released. Uh, I think so, yeah. Brilliant. Actually, I'll, I'll make you choose. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll have you choose. Do you want an, an-, an anecdote uh, about Shelley Winters on Tentacles or Sam Peckinpah on The Visitor? Oh, I gotta go for Peckinpah. Okay. Okay, so this is the answer he gives me when I ask him um, what he thought of Sam Peckinpah. You know, Sam Peckinpah, you know, for anybody out there that that is not aware, has, I would say, a a cameo. Uh, I wouldn't define it a role, has a cameo in The Visitor. I'm not sure I should answer your question. You won't like what I have to say. Anyway... 
I met him at a party. I had been invited by、um, my casting director, and he was there with his manager. Peckinpah came up to me, completely drunk and、uh, fucked up on God knows what, and said, "Are you Italian?" <laughs> yes. Then I want you to give me ten thousand dollars. I answered, "I will if you play a role in my next film." He accepted, but on the set it was a dramatic situation. He had to work for three days. He was meant to be a doctor, if I remember correctly. Ah, yes, a gynecologist. He had an incredibly intense face and could have been a great actor. The first thing he said as soon as he arrived on set was that he wanted to buy a pair of shoes for his part. I sent him shopping with the costume designer. He was only supposed to、um, be seen in the film with this white lab coat, and he wanted twelve pairs of leather boots, cowboy boots. The costume designer or one of the girls from the wardrobe department called me up and told me he demanded these twelve pairs of boots. Buy him a couple, I answered. But he got mad anyway. When he returned to the set, he told me it was a rule that every production he ever works for buy him twelve pairs of leather cowboy boots of his choice. Then on the second day, he asked someone from production for cocaine. Whoever he asked went. And informed me.、Uh, sorry, whoever he asked went and informed my right-hand man, who obviously told me. Listen, Peking Pie is asking us all for cocaine. Not only isn't he going to get it, but if I discover that anyone from the film is passing him drugs, I will fire them on the fucking spot. Not finding any alliance with my assistants, Peking Pie came to me. In all my contracts, I have this clause. You see. He showed me some old contracts where it said that he could have a certain dose of cocaine per day. The word cocaine wasn't、uh, actually used, but the meaning was clear. He got pretty mad when I continued to refuse. Quite menacing, actually. Maybe to spite me, he told me that he was going to change the dialogue of his scene. I was seriously worried, so I decided that I was going to invite him to dinner with some members of the crew and John Houston, to whom I turned for for help. Listen, John. Peking Pie is driving me crazy. Peking Pie had great respect and reverence for Houston. Keep in mind, so I thought his presence would help him calm down a little. Halfway through dinner, things were getting going on quite well. Then a waiter arrives, bringing eleven or twelve bottles of champagne, costing two hundred dollars each. There were just like four or five of us at the table, and I said, "Maybe just two, maybe three are enough." Mister Peking Pie ordered these bottles. Was the waiter's reply. And he had put them on my tab. Obviously, Peking Pie, in the meantime, had the cheeky face of a child who had just been caught with his hands in the cookie jar. He drank most of the bottles himself and went away with one of them in his hand. The next day, I had a meeting with Arkoff from AIP, who was the American distributor of the film. He came from Los Angeles to see what he had done, up, what I had done up till then. While I was with him, I received a call from my production manager. Peking Pie won't come out of his room. He had secured a wonderful lo- we had secured a l- wonderful location for a scene, a whole wing of a big hospital, which we could use for just one day. Peking Pa had been joined by his so-called bodyguard and some country singer friend of his, both of whom, which actually I thought might be Chris Christopherson, anyway,、uh, both of whom had flown to Atlanta to see him. Everybody who knocked on his hotel room door could hear them singing and laughing. I left Arkoff and got to. Got a taxi to the hotel. When I arrived, he was just leaving and was completely coked up. It was early afternoon, and his breath was heavy with the whiskey. Anyway, we managed to get him on the set. Paradisi was making him. Paradisi is the director of the film. Was making him and the girl he shared the scene with rehearse. When all of a sudden, she starts crying. Basically, Peking Pie started whispering obscenities to her. Expli- explicit, sick stuff like, "I'm going to wreck that pussy of yours." Oh, Sam Peckinpah! Wow. Yeah, I I love the aspect of look at these contracts I've worked on prior, which means you have to <laughs> abide by them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I,、uh, just to be clear, I think Sam Peckinpah is a genius. I mean,、uh, uh, Wild Bunch, The Getaway, and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid forged me as a human being.、Um, but yeah, that's that's.、Um, Sam Peckin on the book, so I, it's、uh, it's very rich. Um, um, 
I mean, uh, I'll give you a little preview. Uh, Shelly Winters, uh, Sonitis, uh, says uh, during the interview that uh, he reached her at her hotel room and found her chasing one of the production assistants around, uh, around the bed, expecting sex. <laughs> oh, man, I got to get this book. <laughs> <laughs> So it's uh, it's a it's um, it's uh, it, it's a fun it's fun. There are a lot of uh, very colourful anecdotes, but hopefully there's also you know the context of the time and uh, you know um, uh, how certain projects came to be and uh, you know basically what I would like people to understand is actually how layered the Italian film industry was and at the same time how different it was from you know. Um, the United States, because, you know, you've got Hollywood, at least, has a studio system. We never had a studio system. There were studios, but it's not a studio system. It's a very, it's a very, very different um, uh, kind of uh, production milieu. It's, um, you know, it's more about powerful producers, smaller producers, middle range producers, but it, it, it really kind of all combines and flaps and, and um, uh, onto itself, it's uh, it's much more chaotic and confused than people think. And at the same time, we're genre directors, um, you know, worked on completely different planes at times. You know, you, I read sometimes essays, you know, in which Bruno Mattei, Claudio Fragasso, Lucio Fulci, Fernando Di Leo, Corbucci, uh, Andrea Bianchi, you know, they're all put in this big primordial soup where actually yeah. they were working on completely, completely different planes, different kind of producers, different budgets, you know. Um, yeah, it's very, it's a lot more stratified than people think. So um, hopefully this book starts kind of explaining that a bit. Well, and obviously if you're, if you're just getting into film, especially Italian film, I understand not understanding the, the vast differences, obviously, but it's really difficult to look at somebody like Fernando De Leo and, and say this is the same as Sergio Corbucci. <laughs> they're, you know, they're very different, obviously. Very different, very different. I mean, Fernando Di Leo, for example, um, you know, he's considered one of the masters of uh, Italian noir, but he was working for most of his career very much with restrictive budgets. Um, Corbucci, for example, is somebody who was able to. Really, he, he was uh, an A-list director. You know, right. he was working with big, big stars, um, so much so that he even worked with some of the biggest names of the Commedia Italiana, Vittorio Gasman, for example. Um, he he was working really at, you know, he was one of the, the better paid directors of his generation. He was still considered a genre director, uh, but definitely one of the most respected ones. Fernando Di Leo... Uh, I think it, with Di Leo, it comes down to two elements. I think on the one side, you know, he came from um, very experimental. Uh, he was a writer, first of all, writer very much active. He also worked with Corbucci uh, as a writer. Um, he had a hand, although very superficial, also in Django. The real, the real writer of Django is Franco Rossetti, um, and he has a chapter dedicated to him in Darkening the Talent Screen 1. But um, um, he would came as a director from very kind of experimental, um, politically charged uh, films, uh, which were kind of a, a direct attack to the um, petit bourgeois, you know, the, the middle class uh, films like Brusha Ragazzo Brusha. Uh, but... Um, he always worked, I think, pretty much from 1969 onwards with the same production team, same company, Daunia Settanta, uh, pretty much stick to da with Daunia throughout his career. And I feel there is also a psychological element there. I think Di Leo felt safe there. It's comfortable. I think, you know, he, he kind of, you know, these guys know me. I'd rather work with smaller budgets but have more liberty and... Uh, producers that trust me rather than um, kind of going out there uh, into the unknown. So, yeah, there's there's that element too. But they were 
completely different. You know, from a production point of view, they were completely different. Also, different generations as well. Corbucci started directing sooner, um, and uh, and I think was more of a director actually. Uh, I this is a hot take. Um, I don't think Fernando Dile was a particularly good director. I think he's uh, I think he's a very good writer. I think he's an excellent writer. I think his scripts are innovative. They subvert the genre. Uh, I think his, especially his dialogues are very credible, the way he uses Italian dialect. I think there's a lot going there in his scripts. As a director, I'm not that convinced, you know, he was the best option for his scripts. Uh, he definitely got Caliber 9 right. That's a great film. But even that film... Like, there's some parts which are perfect, you know, apart from the music. But, you know, they're just the composition of the scenes is perfect. You know, you really, they're really focused. But then you get a scene like the uh, Kino's showdown at the end, where you see the American played by Lionel, Lionel Stander. And he's supposed to be this really, like, you know, he's the boss, big boy in town. You know, some everybody dreads him. And there's this kind of little villa with this little dingy little pool, and he's on this plastic-looking kind of like um, uh, swing bench, you know, thingy. And it kind of like looks a bit pathetic. And the you know, Kino killing everybody. Uh, the the stuntmen do their best, and the you know, them falling is fine. The, the acrobatic aspect is fine. It's kind of a little like ah, oh, oh. there's no blood, there's no nothing, and it's right. and uh, it, you know, and they do that thing where, which is very like old school gangster kind of Edward G. Robin, where you shoot the gun and do that, boom, boom, boom. You know, you kind of actually move the gun as if you're as throwing if, the bullet, like throwing the bullet. You know, yeah. boom, boom, you know, that, that's, it's not great. You know, but the writing is so good and music is so good and the acting is really solid. I mean, Gaston and Muskin and Adolf are particularly good. But uh, there are moments where you kind of see Dileo kind of, you know, not putting a lot of focus in, in and a lot of, like, thought in the staging. Right. Um, right. Corbucci is a far, far better director. I love Corbucci. Uh, I mean, uh, Corbucci is is really a director, you know, and uh, and apparently not a very good writer, you know, and I don't think he pretended to be, you know, he had a, a team of writers he used throughout his career, uh, Rossetti being one in the 60s, and then many others, among which also Mario Mendola and his brother Bruno Corbucci. Uh, but he, he was really at heart a director, where I think Dileo was much more of a, a writer. Um my mother did uh, made three films with uh, Di Leo uh, as a script supervisor. She was uh, the script supervisor on uh, Nick the Sting, The Boss, and uh, Rulers of the City. I like Nick the Sting a lot. Nick the Sting, you like it? I, I, it has charm. I mean, out of these yeah. three, I would definitely yeah. say The Boss. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, no, Nick, the Sting is is definitely a charming, charming little film. I mean, but she kind of, you know, uh, said he had very clear ideas of what he wanted, got on set, you know, got on with it. But, you know, he wouldn't waste any time. Like, right. you know, right. um, if they had to finish at five, they finished at five. Even if, you know, he could have gotten an extra half hour to get the scene a little better, you know, he never asked for it. He would, you know, five, whatever we got, let's continue. We'll see everybody the next day. And I, I think that comes through a little bit. That's the, uh, you know, possibly the budget speaking, I guess, on some of that. And that's, especially with some of his smaller films, I feel like that's where he shines a little bit. He, uh, from what I've heard about the budgets being so small, he, he does pretty good to innovate within that budget. For the most yes. part, there, there's some things like the, the pathetic aspect that you mentioned about uh, the other one that the scenes may not be perfect. But what he what he seems to be able to cull from some of those smaller aspects that he gets what you would not expect. I definitely respect that aspect. Yes. No, no, I mean, he's definitely somebody that had clear ideas at times, very, uh, very interesting ones. But I feel they always come from the page. 
I feel it's always a script that is the gold, you know, the kind of the treasure chest he 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 kind of uh, sources from. Um, keep in mind that I mean, before I said his budget budgets were smaller compared to Corbucci, but still, Dileo was working in I would say still in the medium right. medium right. kind of the higher part of the medium range. Um, I mean, uh, a film like Caliber Nine. Gastone Moschin was a was a player at the time in Italian cinema. Uh, he wouldn't have been cheap. Bakalov was not a cheap composer, and in most of obviously most of uh, Leo's films, Barbara Boucher, Lionel Stander, Mario Adolf, those are not cheap um, actors. They would all you know want their you know their usual uh, asking price. Um, so I mean, it's it's definitely smaller smaller budgets compared to many other directors, but he, he was comfortable, yeah. you know, he, he wasn't kind of, you know, um, his, his crews were, you know, uh, stripping away the cast. His crews were 40, 45 people. There were, there wow. were proper sets, you know, he, everything was done by the book. Everybody was paid. Um, you know, keep in mind that, uh, this is another myth that Italian genre film was always made on a budget. Um, that's not entirely true. I mean, uh, uh, they, they were budgets were relatively high, uh, you know, uh, for the time. I mean, if especially if you consider inflation, I would definitely say that uh, you know some you know a, a film like Caliber Nine or The Boss is um, it would be higher in budget than your average American indie, right? Right. Which yeah, I mean, which, a lot of the stories that we get about some of those indies is you know people are renting equipment or selling things at the end of the day to be able to afford filming the next day. Is how 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 tight some of these other sets have been. So yeah, that makes. Oh, but I, I was thinking more like fake indie, like you know, uh, like uh, uh, you know, like the million dollar not shoes, in, <laughs> not in the Hollywood system, but right, not right. quite, you know, not actually really got it independent. Yeah. So yeah, the budgets were, yeah, you know, they were relatively high. I mean, definitely the highest they, kind of the average, the highest they were was in the sixties. Sixties was, uh, you know, you think we always think of the seventies as this really fervent period. It was because so much was happening in Italy and so many genres and subgenres and directors, but there were cracks in the system. Whereas the sixties is really when there you get the economic boom. Interesting. You know, one of the things that I felt that I wanted to really dive into with you last time, because you know so many aspects of the Italian cinema throughout the decades, what is one of the underserved genres or periods that you really hope, uh, especially the home video side, latches on to soon? Okay, well, this is very, very wishful thinking. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, I'd like to see more um, peplums. Uh, historical epics because yeah I mean some are I mean a lot of them are bad but you know there's some that are just just so delightful uh, there's they really are comfort viewing um, they're so naive you know kind of Brad Harris and Steve Reeves throwing down um, uh, kind of, uh, paper columns and I don't know there's there's and but there's also you know that that's really an interesting period in the Italian film history because uh, the real kind of heyday of historical uh, adventure films, peplums, and, and and also to a certain extent pirate movies and uh, adventure movies as a whole, and Cape and Dagger, all that stuff, kind of happened uh, at the end, slightly overlapping with the Hollywood on the Tiber years. It really kind of uh, after the reconstruction of Cinecittà and then obviously the proliferating of other studios, um, that's really kind of the big first genre that the Italian film industry, Italian genre cinema really built on. Right. Um, because obviously we have, there's loads happening before the Hollywood on the Tiber and after you get obviously neorealism, you get uh, Commedia Italiana, you, go, you get so many different, Things happening around that time, but really, Peplum uh, is is the big first uh, genre to be 
you know, distributed all over the world. Uh, you know, uh, Hercules, Le Fatiche di Ercole by Pietro Francisci, uh, you know, was distributed in 300 copies and only in the state of New York at the time. Uh, it was, uh, you know, they made a comic, Americans made a comic strip, a Levine, you know, had this massive uh, uh, kind of marketing for the film going on with posters and, you know, uh, merchandise of all kind. You know, th these, these films have a much richer history than we think. And they were also really kind of the gym, uh, the, the uh, exercising period, the, um, the learning curve for so many directors that then later did Westerns, uh, Sergio Leone, Sergio Corbucci, Alberto De Martino, Mario Cagliano, uh, Gianfranco Parolini, uh, all these directors that later went on to kind of leave their mark on Westerns, started with peplums and venture films. So it's really, it is a, there's a rich heritage there to be explored. And the home video market has really kind of just touched the surface. Mm. Um, and there are also genuinely good films among these, of course. I mean, they're not all just camp. Um, there are some generally good, solid films. Um, another, uh, there isn't quite a genre, I'd say, that I'd like to see more Westerns being released. Um, I'd like, but there, there are some areas of certain filmographies that I'd like to see. Uh, Lucio Fulci, for example, you know, everybody's rushing to get every single Fulci film yeah. uh, out. Um But you've got, you know, so many stuff from the 60s, uh, comedies, the uh, comedies yeah. that, you know, I think would have a market, uh, maybe a box set, uh, trying to reduce cost. Uh, but yeah, there, there's, there's, you know, Fulci, but pretty much every director has, you know, loads of films that still need to be released. I mean, uh, um You know, the usual suspects, I mean, Deodato, Castellari, um, Martino, De Martino. Uh, De Martino especially has loads, loads of films that need to be still released, uh, good and bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, there's still a lot to do. Um, I'd like maybe a little bit to kind of, I'd like a little break from the 80s. Like, we're really kind of, yep. we're going through everything <laughs> 80s related. Uh, I get the fascination, but it would, be, it would be nice to go, you know, back maybe to the 70s and 60s and explore more of those decades. I mean, God forbid we go back to the 50s. Uh, I don't ask that much, <laughs> but at least the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, but from yeah. the historian, I'm going to ask you one question on this, because we hear these myths of, like, Brazil uh, never cared for film events, really. They, they pretty much just tossed them in the back of the warehouse and whatever happened to them happened, no big deal. Italy, we had studios. We didn't quite have the studio system. How, how were most of the elements held up on most of these films? Oh, well, okay. So like in the United States, um, uh, by law, um, every Italian production has to give a copy of to the National Film Registry. Um, so every single Italian film is, arc is in the National Film Registry, in the National Archive. Uh, that said, um, uh, it's a mixed bag. Uh, you know, there's some companies that have everything perfect, you know, to the T. Um, others that, you know, kind of, you know, not quite just threw them in the back of a lorry and, and left them in a ditch, but, you know, not far from there, you know, far, far from that sort of attitude. But um, actually the major problem with dealing with uh, films, finding films, is not so much the how the masters are, but un, kind of unfolding uh, the um, legal issues with the rights holders that's the major issue really the 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 masters um, generally it's more a question of retrieving them from the archives um uh but uh, because we can't legally we can't ask uh, the national archive to give them their to give us a copy of theirs they they have uh 
a copy, but they can't. You know, you can you can ask you can ask it for like festivals and stuff, but you can, not for home right. video right. releases because uh, it can't be for anything that uh, makes money, basically. Um, but only for cultural use. Um, hmm. But uh, but yeah, no, the, the, I've never had a problem finding the masters. Um, uh, sometimes the conditions are bad, but we, you, you can work with them. Um, especially big labels like Vinegar Syndrome have, you know, right. they right. they have their own lab. They they're you know, uh, they have a very very good operation going on. Um, no, the, the the issue is really the rights holders. So it's a mess. It's really a mess. Even trying to understand who owns the film sometimes is a mess. So yeah, that's really I, yeah. the the added value I I bring to Naples is more that, I think. Well, and you're literally the boots on the ground for a lot of these people to find out you know, timelines, uh, literally the chain of uh, who held these rights when and who currently owns them. I, I can't imagine trying to go, you know, for somebody that happened to own it in the in the '90s, we'll say, and they don't realize that they don't own it anymore. The the legal aspect of that is just. I'm getting a headache thinking about it now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, no, it's a it's a pain in the ass. I mean, um, the, you have to deal with uh, with a lot of people, and the problem is that um, it's so. The first thing is understanding who who owns it, and that that can be difficult. Uh, it can be really difficult, sometimes impossible, uh, or it can be easy. But that's the first one. You know, that's the first obstacle. Second obstacle is actually getting an answer from the company, production company, archive, whatever it is that owns the film. And hoping they know where the master is. Right. Uh, because they might, you know, have, you know, have all the paperwork and own the film, but they might not have the elements. So you get an answer from them. And often the bigger the company the more difficult it is to actually get an answer because, say, for example, Mediaset. Mediaset is a huge multinational and they own thousands of films. Right, right. They don't need money from a label. You know, they actually, you are more of a, a pimple on their ass. You know, <laughs> they, they are just annoyed. You know, the the... the I don't know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 euro, 20,000, or even if it were 50,000 euro, they're going to earn from that. doesn't make any difference to them. Yeah, it's pennies. They don't care, you know. Um, they're, they're earning millions. You know, these, these are massive companies. Like, you know, Mediaset is like, you know, it's like going to ABC. It's like BB, or BBC or, you know, they're, they're huge, huge, huge uh companies that you know own cinemas and and tv tv channels and uh, 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 various uh, you know uh, sub companies and you know so they, they don't they don't care uh, so get that's the second obstacle um, and then getting them to communicate because you then I have to kind of go okay stay there I have to go and get the label drag the label make them talk uh, and then hoping they'll find some sort of deal because if they don't find a deal, I'm not getting paid for all the work I've done. Right. Because I only get paid once the deal has gone through, and then I get my finder's fee and and uh, and fixer fee. But uh, so yeah, it's a long process sometimes. I mean, sometimes you get really lucky, and you know, it's bang a week, found everybody, everything signed, and. Uh, we just go on, but uh, other times it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's a pain in the ass. It's kind of a perfect lead-in to the future for all of us, because I mean, uh, th there's been some some news in the last couple of weeks. One of the big ones is you know Disney and Fox pulling out of Australia physical media, and at first a lot of us were rightfully shocked a little bit, but at the same time they weren't selling, so why would they continue in the market? So it, that makes sense. But looking at these companies that make millions and home video is literally, how do we get past that? other than this major tide change of consumers everywhere across the board buying like it's 2001 again? Is there a way that we get back to home video booming? 
Okay, well... This is what I think. Um, I think we'll never go... We'll never go back to the boom uh, of the DVD era, era. We'll never go back to that. Or the initial kind of geyser of enthusiasm when Blu-rays came onto the scene. I don't think we'll ever go back to that I agree. market. I agree. Uh, that's done. You know, we it, it was great till it lost it. We won't go back. I, on the other hand, I don't think physical media will end. Um, I don't think I don't think that uh, it will it will finish. I, I think it will continue. Um, I think um, it's probably going to become a smaller, I don't know if to call it an industry, but let's say a market slightly smaller than it is now. I think within the next five, maybe six, seven years, we'll see a few labels dying off. Oh, yeah. Um, and there might be some big ones as well uh, in the mix, kind of... Um, yeah, closing closing their doors. Um, but I think I think physical media, generally speaking, will survive. Uh, I think there are enough people out there, uh, and I think we are noticing um, generally. I think we are noticing that even although they we're not talking about relevant, maybe crucial numbers. They are still we are we can register younger people uh, buying physical media. Yeah. Um, I don't think know if it'll make a massive difference, but it's definitely there. It's something that is happening, and I think that relates to the fact that you know uh, streaming, which I use streaming by the way. I you know I mostly TV series. I'll watch TV series Same. streaming. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think a lot of people kind of really believed what streaming services were selling at the beginning, which was, you know, we're going to give you this library. It's virtual, but it's in your home. You can access it when you want. Uh, you know, eh, that's not true. Uh, it's simply not true. Uh, you know, titles get taken away. You know, I'll give you an example. I was, you know, with my partner. I think it was uh, around Christmas uh, last year, and uh, her her brother, her younger brother, had not, never seen Twenty Eight Days Later by Danny Boyle. So it's you know it's 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 a good film. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to show him. It was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. I found Twenty Eight Weeks Later. It wasn't anywhere. It wasn't on Disney. It wasn't on Netflix. It wasn't on Amazon. It was nowhere to be found. So we're not talking about some niche film. We're talking about, you know, a major film owned by 20th Century Fox or Fox Searchlight, whatever it was, by Danny Boyle. So yeah, films get taken away. Um, the quality is not great when it goes to all the older films. In fact, it's pretty shitty. Uh, speaking of showing films, I showed... Um, I was shocked and appalled to discover that my partner had never seen The Secret of Nim. Um, <laughs> you know, she's younger, to be fair. She's slightly younger than I am. But uh, uh, so I, I, I had to, you know, I had to solve that problem. So I showed, I showed her uh, The Secret of Nim. What an amazing fucking film is that? Do, do you remember, how, long, how long ago did you see that? Uh, it's probably been a good five or eight years, but yeah. Well, that's, not yeah. that's not too bad. That's not too bad. God, it, it that film destroys me emotionally. It just uh, uh, that Land Before Time and Watership Down. I mean, I will, I will break. You know, in, you know those. Anyway, so um, the quality was shit. I saw, I showed her the Secret of Nim, and the quality was appalling. It was like uh, a bad uh, DVD, basically. It was DVD, God. you know, kind of 2003, four quality. So streaming services have, you know, uh, sold us this illusion initially. And people, I think, are starting to appreciate what physical media brought. And obviously, you know, there are some kind of physical media activists out there, among which even directors, you know, William Friedkin, you yeah. know, who... Yeah as every single human in the world knows, has just passed away. He was, you know, a big 
supporter of physical media. Oh, yeah. And uh, Guillermo del Toro has gone public about, you know, many the, times, uh, he's very, been very vocal. Uh, so, you know, I think people are starting to appreciate, not to mention the fact that, you know, um, you get so much more, you know, with uh, with a Blu-ray. And I know for me and you and for most people listening, that's kind of obvious. But I think people had forgotten that. You yeah. know, I think a lot of people have kind of went... Wait a second. Yeah, I spend whatever eight euros or or ten dollars or fifteen dollars, but you get I get languages, I get subtitles, I get extras, I get a box set. I and you know nowadays with really kind of the boutique labels kind of leading leading the way, you get even more. You get sometimes a soundtrack, you get posters, you get so much more. Um, it becomes an, ex and I think that's the major difference we're seeing. I mean, you know, before you had independent labels, Anchor Bay, and, you know, during the DVD era that did that and did that very well. But I think now it's really the standard, uh, a Blu-ray, a release, a 4K, whatever it is, but a release has to be an immersive experience. Yep. Yep. Uh, you kind of, you know, you buy the film, you watch the film and if you kind of go through all the extras and the booklet and the commentaries and the, the video essays, you end up having a very clear, rich idea about everything attaining to the film. It nearly it is a full immersion. I think that was the case even in you know with DVDs, but it was more some labels doing it. Whereas now I think that's kind of the standard. Uh, it still amazes me to no end when I see films being released um, that don't have extras or, yeah. um, and you know, a lot of a lot of uh, labels have died off because they didn't really adapt to to the times, you know. And as much as I was sorry they did, you know, die, it, they could have maybe had a fighting chance if they had actually adapted. Uh, more to what people want, which is an immersive experience. Um, you know, so I, I think physical media will continue. I think it'll get smaller. Um, eh, but I, I do think, I think eventually streaming services will start offering some of the things Blu-rays offer. I think it'll, it'll take some time, but I see a future that won't obliterate, won't destroy physical media, but there will be a time in which you, I go on Netflix and I, you know, I, I get a film, I choose a film to watch, or I go on Amazon and I spend, you know, three, four dollars to, to rent or buy a film and I get a package. I get a making of, I get a featurette, I get, you know, I get a little, a little package, maybe not as big, as the kind of extras compartment of a Blu-ray, but still, you know, I get a little bundle of stuff. And actually, that's already happened. You know, if you, I don't know about um, other countries, but I'm pretty sure it's the same. In Italy, uh, on Amazon, you can rent Alien, uh, the original Alien by Ridley Scott, and it comes with three making-of featurettes. Oh, nice. Uh so I think that will happen at some point, uh, but I don't think that's enough for physical media to disappear. I think it will continue. Right. It right. will persevere. Um, uh, some labels will have to up their costs uh, in time um, because people also, you know, there are a lot of people that l make a living and have families that work in physical media. There are loads you know, uh, graphic designers and editors and uh, uh, content producers and in-house producers, um, uh, you know, and uh, and that's why some some labels, I mean, some labels are big enough that, you know, they, because they branched out and they have, you know, streaming service, they collaborate with streaming services and, you know, like Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar Syndrome is like a a uh, like a, a mini multinational it's kind of it functions like a little multinational because it has so many things and now it's producing films and uh, you know has has uh, is going to be publishing books and comic books and you know has so much going on 
uh, but so many late and so they can afford, you know, they have in-house producers and graphic designers, they're even hiring now, you know, uh, for warehouse workers and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But many labels, you know, uh, to be able to survive, they they have to, you know, have to do everything. Uh, so when I'm hired, for example, for some labels, I collaborate with an in-house producer. Um, for example, when I work with Vinegar Syndrome, it's a collaboration between I'm a producer, uh, I'm a kind of a, a freelance producer, and then, then there's the in-house producer. And usually the in-house producer I work with is you and Kant you, from Arrow. Uh, you should have him here. Actually, I, I should. You should. You should definitely have him here. Ewan is uh, a hoot. Um, he loves working with me because he knows he can uh, can do fuck all and leave all the work to me. Um, <laughs> uh, you should. Uh, you should. Um, you should have him. You should have him on. He's uh, he's a great guy. Okay. Yeah, he doesn't work with Arrow anymore. He's with Vinegar. But, right, right. Uh, but he worked with Arrow for long, a long, long time. Uh, we actually met uh, for the release of Beyond the Door. You remember that big? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did. Uh, I did all the extras for that. That sucker. And um, and he, yeah, he's he's great. He's great. He owes me. He owes me favors. So if you, if you want me to drag drag him, uh, you know, uh, I I will. Don't worry. He'll. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> I have him by the balls. Don't worry. Um, so um, yeah, I. Um, what? Well, why was I saying that? Oh yes, because uh, you know, with some 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 labels like Vinegar Syndrome, I collaborate with an in-house producer, but then the labels such as um, uh, you know Treasured Films, which is a still a baby label, you know, it's at its third fourth release. Or um, 88 films, where you know they they have people obviously working within the organic of the company, but you know basically I'm I'm the in-house and the freelance producer because that's the only way uh, they can survive because they have to keep right. keep right. everything all costs to a minimum. Well, and what you mentioned just a minute ago is with some of these things, like I mean, even uh, I held this one up earlier, but the. The whip in the body. There's so much in this. We got a booklet. It's tons of extras. If you literally consume everything in here, even if this cost you, I don't even remember what the price was. It's, well, forty dollars US, we'll say, which I think is very high. It's probably like thirty. You get so much for that amount of money. You you have not just uh, how long is this film? It's not. It's yes, yeah, ninety minutes. It's not a ninety minute package. You're talking hours and hours and hours that of you just pouring through every aspect of it the people that aren't doing that your money feels like it goes not near as far as it could yeah. so i get i get getting a little upset with that but that means dive into what you have more yeah 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 absolutely i mean uh, uh, i mean i think a release in which that is incredibly true is this is this bad boy here uh is the last hunter? I mean, this this costs. I don't know. I want to say, let's say uh, twenty pounds. So it's something like that. Yeah. Something like that, and you get inside. You get uh, what did I do for this one? Um, you get a video essay, an audio commentary. You get a documentary on the director, one hour long. You get four featurettes, apart from trailer, image gallery. You get um, a booklet, which is 59 pages long, uh, plus postcards. Basically, I guarantee if you watch everything in this box set, there's pretty much nothing you won't know about the film. It's so amazing that some of these movies get that amount of love. And that, that one's especially true because it was the first release from a brand new label. I mean, the amount of love and attention and like setting off on the right foot that they did with that was just perfect. Yeah, I mean, um, that, well, that's, I think, one of the differences is um, what I'm noticing, you know, with the labels like Visual Vengeance and Treasured Films and... Uh, 
vinegar syndrome is that uh, there's no cynicism. You know, um, uh, these are fans. You know, these are people that really appreciate the films, and um, uh, yeah, they 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 their perspective is that of fans, um, and they you know it was. Um, it's uh, quite remarkable also, and I think the legacy of uh, a lot of uh, boutique labels is not so much, uh, I think, kind of... Um, I, I think they're unsung heroes because they managed to really, more than any uh, director or uh, film historian, you know, they single-handedly, in many ways... Um, through light on so many different films and genres. And, I mean, if you go to FOP in London, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if you know FOP, it's a... Uh, yeah. And, uh, which is kind of my favourite place to go when I, when I go to London. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's fun. You see, you see, like, you know, Ruggero Deodato um, section. You get... Uh, you know, an 88 film section, you get uh, an, an arrow section, and you get, you get, you know, I was looking at recommendations, uh, you know, many shops will have like a section where each person in the shop that works within the shop will kind of recommend yeah. the film. And there was so much like stuff that I'm sure they had never seen before a boutique label had released it. Um, yep. you know, there were so many kind of quirky choices and yeah, I, uh, it, it's just, um, it's just quite amazing, uh, how much they have done for cinephiles really so many boutique labels. Um, and especially, you know, regarding kind of the immersive quality of the releases. Now you get this, you know, these box sets that have everything, uh, inside it of a certain director. You know, you'll have yeah. a nearly a complete filmography. And so you, you get basically kind of a, a lesson in film history uh, in a way, like a chapter of film history, film history in a boxer. So, yeah, boutique labels have done so much more than just, you know, give us nice editions of films. They've, they've you know, um, that's why, I mean, that's what I, I try to do is... Um, when, because a lot of labels, you know, will come to me and kind of go, what do you think will work? You know, and recently, I, unfortunately, I can't uh, announce the titles, but I managed to get Vinegar Syndrome to uh, buy and release two Italian films that have never been released on Blu-ray. And I know oh, there's wow. a market for them. I I'm, I'm, I'm really hope they do have uh, the success they, um, they deserve. They're not great films. They're good fun, uh, I, you know, then far from being masterpieces. But um, this director has had no love on home video at all, even in Italy, has no, no love whatsoever. And to be able to, you know, do that, you know, something new, you know, this is a new director, uh, you know, and the idea that somebody, you know, might watch it and might love it. You know, he, he might become, because of these releases, somebody's favorite director. Uh, yep. You know, uh, in five years, somebody might say, you know, I just love the cinema of this guy. And that's only because, you know, they have been pulled, uh, the, these films have been pulled out of the shadows from, thanks to a, uh, a label. Yeah, that, and then the other streaming thing that I, you know, it, it would benefit us to bring up a little bit is there's still a lot of assumptions with streaming. Um, the, the easiest one to bring out is strong internet. There's still billions of people across the world that don't have access to good, strong internet. So they either deal with buffering, they can't get strumming at all, or it's just the worst quality possible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's that issue as well. And also I'll add to that. There's also, there's also something uh, there's there's something more human about the release, about holding a release. Um, there is, you know, uh, 
there is this idea that um, there's a kind of very new age idea that, you know, you shouldn't be tied to objects. You know, you should be tied to experiences and people. Bullshit. Objects are super <laughs> fucking important because they are an expression of how we feel, because they're tied to people, they're tied to situations. Uh, we project on them, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because we we are, you know, beautiful creatures because we give meaning to things. You know, we we humanize teddy bears. We we see objects in the clouds and and faces in in uh, you know weird pavement designs. You know, we are inclined to uh, make things a, a reason to you know a, a medium of expression. And they're objects that are not just functional. They're not forks and knives. They're uh, they're something that are tied to us and our experiences. You know, um, I don't know about you, but you know, I um, I still have some. You know, I as I upgrade stuff, I sometimes give away or sell or throw, depending. Uh, you know, DVDs um, as I upgrade them, I usually give them away to friends that still collect DVDs. Um, but unless I have a reason, but I kept some DVDs because they're actually tied to some experiences. Um, I oh, yeah. remember where I was when I bought them, you know. Um, I remember who gave me that, uh, you know, that. Uh, I've got, you know, I've got objects that were given to me by by people that were important to me in that moment in my life. So, you know, um, objects are important, and we are uh, very much uh, tied to them as humans and that's actually I think our real you know our real humanity is that we as humans are not supposed to roam the world without objects or uh, we shouldn't be morbid uh, obviously you know but that goes for anything we shouldn't you know we shouldn't we shouldn't um, be pathological about stuff but to say that objects are right. you know shouldn't be important in your life is absolute bullshit one of the ways that I've always looked at that is we can control those objects. One of the things that is my biggest fears is my mental faculties. I can't control losing those. Uh, you know, we talked about senility a little earlier with some of these directors. The experiences that I've had are tied to these objects. If I just lose everything, I'm going to lose some of those memories. I guarantee yes. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not to mention, uh, not to mention just, you know, throwing out it's, we'd lose we'd lose uh, a lot of graphic designers and illustrators would lose work. Uh, you know, so, and, and they become actually ni really nice objects, you know, um, uh, pretty, pretty to have, pretty to, you know, uh, have exposed and, uh, on, your, on your shelves. I mean, um, and I agree, it's, um, you know, ob objects are important because they tie us to periods of our lives, uh, to people, to situations, um, and not to mention the fact that I think um, objects are a way we have of um, of actually, because they're tied to times of our lives and people, they're actually a way we, they're mirrors in which we judge how time has passed. Uh, you know, and yeah. and evaluate the pe certain periods of our lives and our choices, um, and I think they they become like little pins we put on this invisible map. Um, so I think they 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 are very they are very important objects. Um, well said. And Blu-rays are objects. Very many uh, objects in this room. Quite a few in yours as well. <laughs> well, uh, uh, this has been much more productive than last time. And the last thing we went through on the last conversation is what was coming up for you? Anything coming up on the horizon that you want to share that you're excited about? Well, obviously, this one. It's a big deal. Please, you know, uh, have a glance. Hope uh, you know. Hopefully, it will um, uh, t 
tickle uh, somebody's curiosity. Um, apart from that, uh, well, I'm putting together a, a three-hour documentary, which will be released directly on an American physical media label. Interesting. I can't say more, but uh, dang it! Uh, yeah, and then what else? Uh, that's pretty much uh, it. I mean, I'm I mean, working on already <laughs> loads of loads of stuff. I mean, loads of stuff. Right, uh, right. Um, September will be packed with um, packed with uh, announcements. Really packed with announcements. Um, I, uh, I'm checking actually my schedule just to see how many, so you can expect, let me see, you can expect, uh, 13 different films being announced in September. Just that you've had your hands yes. in, that's... That's amazing, man. Yeah. 13 in September. I mean, obviously wow. some will slip to October. Others will be delayed for some reason. But yeah, theoretically, you know, uh, completely in theory, 13 should be announced. Are scheduled to be announced in September. Um, but I mean, at the moment I'm working for, you know, three, three films. No, sorry. Four films for Vinegar Syndrome and uh, five Four films, yeah, four and four. Four for Vinegar and four for 88. Uh, all of which will be released uh, from February onwards. So, um, wow. yeah, there's pretty much... Uh, the next year is paved with uh, releases. I I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad that you keep doing this. I'm so glad that labels are relying on somebody like you to connect the dots for those of us that can't just travel to Rome and meet these people ourselves. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, uh, I'm very critical of my work in the sense that, um, you know, sometimes I would like to just kind of grab everybody who buys something I've worked on, and, you know, some, on some releases and go, okay, before you put that in your PlayStation or your Blu-ray, um, you know, please remember, I had one week to do this. That's what I'd like, you know, or, you know, I had uh, whatever this, you know, this ridiculous budget to do. Uh, you have to cut corners sometimes to make things happen and, and it gets messy. And sometimes, you know, uh, as I said, uh, where there is um, quantity, there are going to be shifts in quality. And uh, it's, you know, my, my attempt is to keep the standard as high as possible despite that. But it gets, it, it is complicated. Uh, I look back to some stuff I've done and I cringe. I mean, the first, been doing this for six years. The first three, I was uh, ADing as well. I was an AD uh, in in Britain and in Italy. I was working on, on films in both countries. And, uh, and so this was kind of a side job. And then it became full-time uh, my third year. Uh, but I will look back at the stuff I did uh, during that period and I kind of like really cringe. Uh, but, you know, it's a mixed bag and uh, hopefully m most of what I do is appreciated. Um, at the end of the day, you know, if people buy it are happy, I'm happy. That's the uh, bottom line. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, just a humble servant. Wow. That's, I mean, I, I love the philosophies behind this. You, you're doing great work. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Appreciated, and thank you for you know um, spreading the good word. So it's the least I can do. Uh, same sort of thing, Br bringing some of the the human aspect. I mean, some of these interviews, some people won't check out, but just seeing the face behind them, it might intrigue them and in, into a way that now they will. Very true. By the way, is that carry poster? Is that like? Is it a poster or is it? It is a poster. It is a light box frame, so I can uh, unfold these and just replace it with a different poster. Nice. Pull out the plastic, put it behind it. It's nice, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Well, great. Had a, had a, a patron of the channel actually made that for me. Really? 
Yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for your time today, my friend. Uh, glad to be. And uh, I'm sure in a good nine or ten months, we'll we'll talk again. Absolutely. All right. Good luck with everything. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you for listening to the Disconnected Podcast. There's one big thing that you could do to help the show, and that is to leave a rating and review on the podcast service of your choice. Thank you.